Our scripture today is the first chapter of Jonah. I encourage you to find it in your Bible and don't feel bad if you have to look at the index of where the books fall. It's a little bitty book. As we enter this story, I want you to remember that this Hebrew text with all the markers of poetic writing is a story. This one is drawn in big images to catch listeners' attention and make one comforting point. Jonah is not here to teach doctrine. So listen and enjoy and then let yourself sink into a story that's been told for generations. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. And then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down, and he was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? Where is your country? And of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this you have done? For the men knew he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up. Throw me into the sea, and then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it's because of me this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more stormy against them. And then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased its raging. Then the men feared the Lord all the more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Perhaps you know the rest of the story. 
Jonah finally prays, gets spit out on the land, and this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of my favorite writers, Parker Palmer, states, We fear encounters in which the other is free to be itself, to speak its own truth, to tell us what we may not wish to hear. We want those encounters on our own terms so we can control the outcomes, so that they will not threaten our view of the world and ourselves. Jonah pulled quite a stunt of geographical disobedience here. Drawn as clear as a political cartoon in the face of God's call. In verse 9, when he says, I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made sea and dry land, the Hebrew word here carries an ambiguous note of both fear and worship. A better translation might be, God of heavens whom I am fearing, who made sea and dry land. In other words, Jonah's anxiety had risen to a point where he was scared to death of God's call to him, afraid of an encounter that might change him and his life. That's why he headed to Tarshish, just opposite of Nineveh. His anxiety over an unknown future led him to attempt to restore control to his life, and it didn't work very well. My allergist once told me, when your immune system is already at its peak of coping, any little thing can set it off, set off an allergy attack. This week, the tensions of our world include a pandemic, Breonna Taylor's demonstrations, RBG's death, and a contentious presidential election, which might just be enough to raise an entire nation's immune system to a breaking point of anxiety. We are all on edge. Psychology says when situations threaten the ability to meet basic human needs, people become anxious and attempt to restore control, exactly what Jonah did. But is it possible to control our anxiety? Especially when it's a justified anxiety over all that has changed in our world. If we clamp down on our feelings and don't allow ourselves to feel that free floating fear of the future, will that help? No way, Jose. Burying our feelings actually increases our anxiety. For when we attempt to push our feelings down under, we increase the pressure, like steam in a teapot. We will blow up and out eventually. Nor are we able to control other people, even small ones. In parenting classes, I often taught, you can't make a child eat, sleep, or speak. Pick your battles, parents. For you can't change another's behavior. But you can change yours. And that makes all the difference. Yes, major things are affecting our world, and yet we do not have to control the world to feel better. 
Thanks be to God. Instead, we find out what we can do, and we do that. A bit of control over self is a wonderful therapeutic tool, according to a friend who works with such every day. Doing what we can do, recognizing that we are in control of that, empowers us. In hospice, I learned that those with limited time to live need to exercise the control they do have. And so we honored their choices as much as we possibly could. Having agency gives power, needed power, to those whose choices seem limited. Such power or control is legitimate and necessary and helps us cope. Some ideas for you. For political angst, we can choose to volunteer, put up signs, do something constructive, and limit our news intake. Amidst this virus, we wear our masks, wash our hands a lot, and then get creative. Find ways to see and interact with our friends and new ways to do what we love to do. We just do it safely. To change racial mores, we summon strength from God to speak up and act for ourselves and others anytime we sense discrimination taking place. For ever-present boredom, do something different. Hey, I let my hair go white and cut it all off. But when we begin to demand that all encounters be on our own terms, that's when we get into Jonah's type of trouble. Back to Parker Palmer. We fear encounters in which the other is free to be itself, to speak its own truth, to tell us what we may not wish to hear. We want those encounters on our own terms so that we can control their outcomes, so they will not threaten our view of world and self. I wonder if the conflicts about mask wearing and similar ones decades ago when seatbelts were introduced are about this. We claim freedom, but we want control. Control over others, control over our view of ourselves, control over the coronavirus, control over God. Freedom and control are not the same thing because freedom means all are free. My freedom stop where yours begin. Freedom comes with justice. And that's the thing about living in God. Only the perspective of the one who created the world is broad enough to encompass what's best and just for all people, for all creation. And we, when tuned in to God, have the opportunity to contribute to that kind of freedom, that kind of compassion, as called by God to do so. Instead of limiting ourselves to our blinded view of the world, or to the small self inside us. Jonah was caught up in his small self, not considering the bigger picture, God's love for even the Ninevites. He attempted to protect himself by running the other way when he heard God's call. His view of God as one to be feared led him to leave the God he loved even avoiding prayer when all the others of the ship 
entered in. When you feel the need to control the other, try to do something different than what Jonah did. Instead of ignoring or thwarting what feels like a true call of love to act for another's good, try surrendering to it. Allow yourself to sink into God. Prayer is what will get you there. A couple of weeks ago, I began to sense anxiety rising in my cell. I tried to control it, way too much Sudoku to escape it, but I still felt it in my gut. I tried to blame it on others. My husband was handy, but that was wrong. So I did some volunteering, and then I worked in my garden, both things that bring me joy. And I still felt it hanging on. One day, I woke up to the fact that journaling had, in the past, helped crystallize free-floating fear for me. And so I decided I might as well give it a try. Over the next week, as I began to journal how I felt, I began to feel calmer. In the midst of writing on paper a bunch of very jumbled feelings. And before long, I realized this had become prayer. Prayer as connection to God, not a transactional exchange. A prayer of gratitude for having named suppressed feelings, feeling heard in doing so, and feeling a relief that was unanticipated. I pray for you to find a way to connect with God when it feels like God has troubled your waters with or without words. It may not look like prayer, bike riding, walking in nature, art, talking with friends, dance. Do something you can do that brings you joy, and God will show you a way out of your wilderness. As you realize that the God of compassion is with you, you'll know it has become prayer, that you are wading in the water which is God's presence, simply by being true to yourself. As we grow into the truth that so much of what happens in the world does not require and will not respond to our control of it, and that this too shall pass, there is a strange but true relief that surfaces, realizing that we are creature and God is creator, situates us correctly in the universe, says Richard Rohr. And that allows anxiety to fade, the need to control others to subside as we join in the graceful give and take of the dance of life, able to go where we are needed, where we are called, fully ourselves in God when there. And it's prayer that can get you there. Old Jonah was in a pickle with God. His view of God as a fearsome being sent him off the deep end, trying to control his future by avoiding God. But hidden in the hull of a ship heading the wrong way, the storm buffets him and all the others threatening their lives. When he confesses his own truth to fellow sailors, the essential first step, 
He literally gets thrown out into the deep water, totally out of control. Inside the big fish, he finally prays for the first time in the story and admits his need for help. And through the grace of God, he is saved, thrown up onto dry land. Jonah did not want to have to rely on God or anyone but himself. The point of this whole story is that the God of compassion was there for Jonah and all the Ninevites. And this is the kind of God who is there for you. You can open that place in yourself to let God in with any kind of prayer. And God won't send you out on a call without going with you to strengthen you, help you, and cause you to stand upheld by God's own hand. Amen.